Growing up, I was always confused at the fact that me and my sister, who's genetically most like me in the world, could have such divergent views on important issues, such as who had the better fashion sense. <laughs> and it's still not settled. And then when I got to school, I really did think the world was against me, because here were hundreds of other kids who seemed to take on a human form, but who also seemed to have an alien brain. And I say this because they all seem to have different ideas and opinions to me. And not only that, they all seem to have a different abilities as well. Some got more uh, points on the sports field, others got more marks in the classroom, and others got away with things more than I did. But by the time I left school, these differences no longer confused me, they fascinated me. So I decided to go off to university and study exactly that, little old Rhodes University in Grahamstown. And I threw myself into studying as much about humans as I could, from psychology to human factors to human performance, and I absolutely loved it. But by the end of my undergrad, I wasn't quite sure where I was going to channel what I'd learned. Then one holiday, I took the 10-hour trip with my family from Johannesburg in the interior of South Africa to Kids Beach on the coast. We left at about 2, 3 a.m. to avoid traffic. My dad's mad like that. Um, and I had the first keep dad company shift. He was high on Red Bull. And we'd been driving for about an hour or two, and we were on one of South Africa's long, straight stretches of road. And we came up behind what's common in South Africa, a minibus taxi. And we could see that it was full of men, women, and children in bags packed up to the roof. Similar, very similar to this one, in fact. And then my dad said to me, watch what this car is doing. And then we watched as over the next few minutes, this car was weaving in its lane. My dad, who's an experienced driver, decided to not overtake, decided to pull back, and then we watched again how this car over the next few minutes would weave. But then all of a sudden this car started to drift into the lane next to us. We were mortified. We could see this car coming towards us. Headlights were bright. At the very last second, the driver corrected and avoided the head-on collision. But unfortunately, the correction turned into overcorrection and is stored in my memory as a slow motion clip. I can recall seeing this minibus taxi full of men, women, and children veer off the road into the field alongside, rolling, killing everyone on board. I grew up in South Africa, and I knew the stats were bad. They're always on the news. But like most things, you just it becomes second nature. And I never realized it was that bad. So at the start of my postgraduate studies, I decided that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to understand why a driver would put himself in that situation, and did he? And could that have been us if I wasn't keeping my dad company? Since then, I've learned some interesting things about us humans as drivers. We're highly adaptable. We are tolerant of ambiguity and uncertainty. We're great problem solvers, and we've got a highly evolved sensory perception system, which means that on the whole, we're actually pretty good drivers, and accidents are fairly rare. But I'm sure you'll agree that one is too many. And of those that do happen, human error accounts for the majority. That's because we're human. That's because we, we get bored, we get tired, we get confused, distracted, and we've got a limited reaction time. And, you know, when I think about humans as drivers, it's not all that bad, but there are things that people have done all around the world to try and limit the impact of human error. And in places such as the United Kingdom and Sweden, they've done quite well, but they haven't completely solved the problem. Now, as far back as the 1950s, there was this crazy idea to do just that, to solve the problem completely. In 1958, the publication Science Digest opened an article boldly with the following statement. Driving will one day be foolproof and accidents unknown when science finally installs the electronic highway of the future. Now, that was 58 years ago, and we're still waiting. 
but should we be? And isn't it unreasonable to think that we shouldn't be, given that over the last hundred years, the nature of driving hasn't really changed much. Sure, the roads have got better, the cars have got safer, but at the end of the day, it's still just a driver turning a wheel on a stick telling a lump of metal where to go. But here's the thing. The technology behind the self-driving car changes that relationship for the first time. But when I say self-driving car, what do I mean? What do you think I mean? What do you think? When I speak to people about the self-driving car, a lot of people think it's some futuristic concept. Some people know that Google has been doing work in the area. Others have seen headlines here and there. But few know that all major car makers have some ambition to have a, some form of limited self-driving car on the road by the end of the decade. We might even see an iCar. This technology is seeping in fast and it's speeding up and I think it's going to have a bigger impact on our lives than what we might realize. It's as if we're all sat on this beach and there's this massive tidal wave coming towards us but we can't quite see it because there's this curtain between us and it and we'll only be able to see it when it's right on top of us. Today I'm going to be pulling back the curtain for a couple minutes so that we can try and think about what it actually means for us on a couple different levels. When we ask the question, are we ready for a self-driving car, we could come at it from a few different perspectives. You could say, is our technology ready for a self-driving car? You could ask, are we as a society ready for a self-driving car? Or you could say, are we as individuals ready for a self-driving car? Not only are we happy to have them, but are we capable of having them? Well, the technology is the reason we've been waiting for 58 years. But things are slowly starting to tick over where we can see something's happening. And it's important that you understand how it's going to be introduced to you. I'm sure some of you have had some experience with cruise control. And now, adaptive cruise control and park assist. Next, you'll have lane keeping assistance, then automatic braking, then collision avoidance systems, then lane, keep, then lane change systems, then intelligent navigation systems. And so you can see how, in an almost modular fashion, your car is going to become more intelligent. So it's not going to be a case of a binary shift between manual and self-driving vehicles, but rather this considerable weaning period. But what does that weaning period mean for us? I'll come back to that in a minute. How about our society? Well, the pillars of our society will have to adapt to the self-driving car as with any disruptive technology. Our economy is going to have to change with the changes to job distributions that self-driving cars will bring. Our city planners and engineers will have to think of new ways of bringing infrastructure into the cities and, and also what are we going to do with all the old infrastructure that leaves behind, like all the parking spaces in the cities. Our legal experts are going to have to tussle with important issues of liability and ethics and responsibility and our security experts are going to have to think about outsmarting cyber criminals before they even exist. The values and behaviors of cultures and societies around the world are as diverse as the people within them. So car makers are going to have to think hard about how they're going to design the personality of their self-driving vehicle, their automated driver. Now, I don't have the answer to these questions and these problems, but I do know that it's the tip of the iceberg. And when I think about it, I think, you know, we tend to make decisions based on what impact they'll have on our day-to-day -day lives. So I'm interested in what the self-driving car means to you directly as a driver. Of course, the safety implications of self-driving cars are going to far outweigh any other benefit you can think of. But if I ask you to reimagine your lives today with a self-driving car, you might think, think of some other things. You might think, I don't have to drive myself all the way to work, which means that I will probably be more productive on my commutes, which means that you might consider buying that cottage in the country by that stream. 
You might become less emotionally attached to the act of driving and think that it makes less sense to have one of your own, especially if you need a special license to use it and if an Uber self-driving taxi is only ever five minutes away. Now, there's some less obvious things or maybe problems we'd need to consider, and I say they're less obvious because, technically speaking, they don't exist yet. Recall that weaning period I mentioned. Now, the point at which your vehicle is so intelligent that it can take you from point A to point B with the ability to traverse all manner of road, traffic, weather scenarios without you ever having to intervene ever is a long way off. Which means that you're going to have to still be involved and responsible on some level for some time to come whether it's the early systems that require you to still have your hands on or around the steering wheel, or even the more advanced systems that require you to be available in case something goes wrong. But how do you think you will react if something goes wrong? Let me take you through an example of what I mean. Have you ever woken up in a strange hotel room? If you've ever been in that situation, you'll know the panic and confusion in those first couple of seconds where you look around and your mind is foggy and it takes you a while to figure out where you are in space and time and in some cases, why are you there? Now this probably isn't a crisis, but now let's imagine it's 10 years from now. Keep that thought in your head. Imagine it's 10 years from now and you've got yourself a self-driving car. It's taking you down the motorway, you're engrossed in your film or your emails and then all of a sudden, lights start flashing and bells start beeping and you look up and all you know is a blur of lights of lights and vehicles and that you need to do something or in the worst case scenario you might crash now unlike the example of the hotel room in this situation you can't really take too much time to figure out where you are and what you need to do how do you think you'll respond here I can tell you that some of you are going to end up not trusting your vehicle, even though you know it probably could, what that sales guy told you. But I can also tell you that the other half of you will probably overestimate how intelligent your vehicle is, or rather underestimate how dumb it is. Sending that tweet when you should be watching the road. <laughs> so, here at Leeds, we've been working on figuring out exactly that problem. What happens when drivers are put in this, into this situation? As part of an integrated European project, we are working with car makers and research institutes across Europe to try and understand what the driver's capabilities and limitations are in their interaction with these advanced systems. Let me show you an example now of what could happen. This is Ruth. Now, Ruth was visiting our lab at the time, and Ruth has a PhD that focused on hazard perception in driving. So she's a more than capable driver. She was visiting our lab at the time, and we asked her to be involved in an experiment that we designed to simulate that feeling of waking up in a strange hotel room, but then having to deal with an unexpected event in a self-driving car. Here you can see Ruth sitting in our University of Leeds driving simulator in a fairly simple highway scenario. And what you saw just before was the screen was blacked out just slightly because we wanted to limit the amount of information that she had before she had to deal with something, simulating, doing something else. So Ruth, the capable driver and hazard perception expert who was with us for a job interview at the time, um, had to look around, figure out what was going on and do something. Let's see what she does. Afterwards, um, Ruth said that she did identify the hazard, which is a good thing because she got the job, um, <laughs> but that she simply trusted that the car would deal with it itself. Now, even if the first case was true and she did, didn't identify the hazard, that's still a scary outcome, don't you think? 
And we've since seen that drivers display a diverse set of responses to situations just like those. And unfortunately, there are lots of factors that influence how well Ruth or others could have dealt with a situation like that. As one, you might say, well, it's obvious that you know what your car can and can't do. But remember that thing I said about underestimating and overestimating. And also remember that in safety science, we always consider the worst case scenario and then build our knowledge from the ground up. So as these systems become more intelligent, advanced, and sophisticated, so will the problems with interacting with them evolve. But if we can understand what the driver is thinking, where they're looking, how they understand the system to work, whether they trust the system, and then what they end up actually doing when they have to use the system, we can help make car makers make more efficient, more intuitive, and especially more safe systems. So when we return back to the original question and flip it on its head and ask rather, when will we be ready for the self-driving car, we'll find that the answer comes at the intersect of work done on three sides of the problem. The technology, the society, and the individual. Now, it's a great time to be doing work in the area. And I can tell you, it's moving so fast that sometimes we forget to stop and take note of what we're doing and why we're doing it. But every now and again, I get flashbacks of that accident back in South Africa. And I think, damn, you know, even the most simple lane keeping assistance could have saved those lives. They need not have died. And I was back in South Africa for Christmas to see my family and my heart sank when I saw this headline in what was almost the exact same road, in what was the exact same scenario, 19 more people died. You know, <laughs> so I don't know if we're ready for the self-driving car yet. And I know there are going to be a couple bumps along the road. But we sure do need it. Thank you.